Again, I am Pastor Chris Myros. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Grab your Bibles if you don't have them. Um, we're going to be, again, continuing on in the book of John, John chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there are some in the chairs. There's also some on the Welcome Center as you exit the double doors to the left. Uh, there are Bibles there. You could also use a phone, iPad. Um, version is a great app if you're looking for uh, a way to find the Bible on your phone. Um, frankly, uh, I, I have my phone everywhere I go. I have a Bible as a pastor most everywhere I go because literally one sits in my seat next to me on the car. But occasionally I'm somewhere without a Bible. And if I'm without a true print Bible, I've got that right here in my hand. You know, I've got that, that Bible. I can open it up and I can look and see and I can uh, add a quick reference, especially like when you get into the Old Testament. You get into some of those prophets and you're trying to look something up. Even I as a pastor, I'm like, Nahum, where is that? You know, but you can cheat like a new version. There's a little drop down box and you can find it real fast, right? Uh, so, so it is a, a handy tool to have. But we're going to be in John chapter 3. As I said, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to dive right in. We started John chapter 3 last week. And the very first part of John chapter 3 is Jesus having a conversation with Nicodemus. And we're going to actually pick up the second half of that conversation today. And there's going to be basically two parts of the text that we're going to be in. We're going to be in the um, verses 9 through 21 today. And some of you might say, well, pastor, didn't you preach John three seventeen a couple of months ago? Yes, I did. But that doesn't matter. It's still really good. And you're going to get more of it. So there you go. I'm looking forward to it, in fact. And the first half of this conversation with Jesus and Nicodemus is uh, where we're going to start off. And then the second half of what we're looking at today, then, is kind of John's commentary on the conversation that Jesus and Nicodemus were having. So I'm going to read this to you. We're going to start in verse 9, and then we'll dig in. And if you want to follow along, again, it's John 3. Uh, 9 through 21, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth of the Gospels. And there it reads, and you'll see on the screen up above as well, Nicodemus said to him, to Jesus, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except for he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here's the part you probably probably do know. There it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then, as I've said before, what I think is one of the most important verses in all the Bible, in 17, it says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. Or carried out in God, I guess is how it reads, sorry. Now if you only hear one thing of all of what I say for the next... I don't know, 75 minutes? Right? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. I would get bored of myself. But if you only hear one thing, hear this. If you forget everything else, this is the key of all the keys of everything there is to be said today. Hear this. You can only enter the kingdom of God through belief in the saving work of the Son who came to do uh, a mission that was a consequence of the love of the Father and a love that gives and sends fully and freely to save and redeem. Now I know that's a mouthful. And I'm going to dig through that for the rest of our time. That's going to guide our conversation for the rest of the time we have today. Lots of nuggets in that, that passage or that, that sentence. It's really a long sentence. Uh, Lots of things for us to mine from that. So let's dive into that first part that I just read, verses 9 through 15. And and if if you're listening, and I'm going to read a little bit of it, it says, Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be, right? 
Now, Nicodemus here, what he's referring to is the first part of their conversation that we talked about last week, where Jesus had told Dick and ne- ne- Nicodemus, I'm going to get his name right, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, he had told you, hey Nicodemus, in order to be saved, you've got to be born again. Right? That happened in the very first part of this conversation. Which was a perplexing thing to Nicodemus, of course. And so then as it says, Jesus answers him. Jesus says to him, because he doesn't understand this, this being born again. Jesus answers him, are you a, a teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you of earthly things and you don't believe, well then, how, how are you going to believe if I tell you about heavenly things, Right? And he says, no one has ascended into heaven except for he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And then Jesus stops. That's his response to Nicodemus. And this is going to be really critical. Because the next part is what he says. Is He says, and this is a part where I think a lot of people won't understand this unless we dig into it. Jesus then says something. He says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Uh, you hear that and you go, what? Right? I mean, the uh, first time I heard this passage, I'm like, Moses, serpent, what? I mean, I, I know I read that Old Testament part, but I, I don't get the correlation. Jesus, Moses, serpent, huh? Lift it up. Uh, where, 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 what does this mean? So let me give you a little bit of the background here so you understand it. And we know from last week, uh, Nicodemus is a, is a very serious man. He's very serious about his religion, right? We know that he's a Pharisee. Uh, and, and in fact, we know this is the first encounter that Jesus has with a Pharisee that's recorded here in the book of John. And, and the main thing you need to know about the Pharisees is that their zeal was to, to obey God's law. And, and unfortunately, they also created some laws that supposedly were supposed to help you obey God's law, but they weren't really God's law, but they, they were trying to live out their faith. They, they were zealous, they were genuine in their attempts, even at times when they were misguided. They were trying to live out their faith. And there are over 613 different commands laid out in the Old Testament. And, and these Pharisees were very zealous about strictly obeying all of the do's and don'ts of the Bible, right? And, and we know that not only was Nicodemus a, a serious leader, uh, not only was he a pious, a churchly leader, a, a, a holy guy, but we know from verse 1 that he's also a powerful leader. Uh, most likely he was a member of the Sanhedrin as well, which is kind of the ruling class uh, among the Jews in Jerusalem there. And so this guy, this, this leader, the Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus in the cloak of darkness. He comes to Jesus at night, right? Not in broad daylight, but he kind of sneaks in quietly and, and, and it is believed because he doesn't want everybody to know he's going to talk to Jesus, right? Um, it's trying to keep it quiet a little bit. And so he comes to Jesus and he asks him some questions. He, he asks Jesus about his teachings and, and that's the kind of backdrop, the scene for this conversation that's taking place between him and Jesus. And so Jesus responds to his questions with what is probably the worst possible news that a Pharisee could possibly hear. We know that he says in verse 3, unless someone is born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. And, and why this was really, really bad news, hard news for Nicodemus, was that what Jesus is saying here is that, Nicodemus, I don't care about your religious credentials. I don't care that you're some big, hotshot religious dude. Your credentials aren't good enough to get you into heaven. See, he had worked hard all of his life to elevate himself, to live the way he was supposed to live, to do all the things, to follow all the rules, to jump through all the hoops. And Jesus looks him in the eyes and says, that, that, that stuff's not good enough. You are not good enough. Your, your following the rules isn't good enough to get you into heaven. And throughout this conversation, Nicodemus has recognized that Jesus is a teacher who has come from God. We saw that in verse 2. But at this point, he, he, he neither understands Jesus, we see that in verse 10, and he doesn't believe in Jesus, we see that in verse 12. And so what happens is then Jesus moves to, a, to an Old Testament story that he'd be familiar with, this Old Testament story with Moses, right? Nicodemus would have known 
the story about Moses very well. He was a guy who would have studied the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, extensively. And so when he goes to this reference, Nicodemus would have understood what Jesus was saying. And, and, and this is where we see Jesus basically closes the conversation with him, is this Old Testament narrative. And what's happening in this story with Moses, if you don't remember this, um, is that Moses has this bronze serpent, right? And while the Israelites were, Is- Israelites were out in the desert, in the wilderness, wandering, what was happening was the desert's poisonous snakes were coming up and they were biting and killing God's people. And so what Moses does is he crafts this bronze snake, he, he affixes it to the top of a pole, and when people were bitten by these poisonous snakes, all they had to do was gaze upon that, that bronze snake on top of the stick, and it would save them from death. And Nicodemus here is being challenged to turn to Jesus for new life, in much that the same way that the Israelites were commanded to turn and stare at this bronze snake to be saved. Turn to Jesus to be saved as the Israelites turned to the snake to be saved. And he says, as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness for the Israelites to see and be saved, so too must the Son of Man then be lifted up. Now this phrase, lifted up, right? It occurs four different times throughout this gospel. And it always occurs in combination of, of two different notions. Of Jesus physically being lifted up onto the cross, and Jesus being spiritually exalted. Uh, very similar to what we would see like in Isaiah 6. We also would see it in Isaiah 51 and 52, for instance. So Jesus is trying to point out to Nicodemus that our radical corruption from sin requires a radical redemption from God. Let me say that again because I think it's important. Our radical corruption from sin requires a radical redemption from God. (coughs) As, As Jesus has been saying to Nicodemus, we need a brand new birth. And this lift it up points us to the crucifixion where Jesus was on the cross, uh, just like the the bronze serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. And to trust or believe in the cross is necessary for our new life. And these words, trust and believe, are actually used 241 different times throughout the New Testament. And, and, And John is the master of using trust and believe. He uses it 98 different times in his book. And it's used eight times alone in this passage that we have here. So so what is Jesus doing? What Jesus is doing is he's drawing the line with Nicodemus that, that, that new birth comes through one way and one way only. Through trusting and believing on the cross of Christ. We see this in Romans 5. For while we were yet sinners, while we were weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And then it says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, while we were still drenched in our sin and lost, that Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by Christ's blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And then we see in Romans 10.9, another pertinent passage to this. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Or how about Ephesians 2.8? Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is of the gift of God. (coughs) Excuse me, I've got a tickle going. Now the single, unmistakable sign of new birth is faith in the person through the work of Jesus Christ. And this faith is not something that we can attain. It's simply something that we receive. (coughs) I'll get over this shortly. R.C. Sproul, many of you know him, a great Christian pastor, theologian, very influential in the last 40 years probably. 
And R.C. Sproul talks about it this way. He says, if you have in your heart today any affection for Christ at all, it is because God, the Holy Spirit, in His sweetness, in His power, in His mercy, in His grace, has been to the cemetery of your soul and has raised you from the dead. Jesus, in this closing discourse with Nicodemus, also shows that all of the Old Testament is pointing to the cross. That through the lifting up of the sun, we can be fully, finally, and forever free from sin and from death. So we, we enter the kingdom of God only, as I said, through the belief in the saving work of the Son. And we're going to see the Son's mission is a consequence of the love of the Father. A love that, that loves to give and a love that loves to send. That gives and sends fully and freely in order that we might be redeemed. <coughs> and this brings us to kind of the, the core of our message today in verses 16 through 21. Now there's two different ways that God's love is described in the passage that we're looking at today. The first way that it's described is described in John 3.16. It's a love that gives, right? And regarding that, a love that gives, I want to speak to anyone who, who may be here today who, who, who may not have made that decision yet to follow Christ, who, who maybe isn't a believer, who, who somebody who might be walking through a, a, maybe you're in a deep season of doubt, of struggle, of beliefs, your, your faith has been waning or struggling or weakening, or maybe you don't have it, and, and you're in this season of significant pain or suffering and trials, and found, trials against the foundations of what it is you believe, and your life is just scattered. Maybe once what you believed is no longer, and you're just floating and wondering, where is God in all of this, right? That's exactly who I want to speak to in this portion. And we'll get to that in a second. And the second way it's described in John 17 uh, is, a, is that there's a love that God uses that sends. And when I get to that part, we're going to talk with everybody else in the room, all who are believers in Jesus Christ. But let's start off with that first part in John 3, 16. This, this amazing love that gives. If you indulge me, read along with me. We don't do this too often. Let's read John 3.16 together. You'll see it on the screen. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now the very first word in John 3.16 is for, right? And what this, what this means and what this is there for is it's telling us that what we are about to say, what we are about to read, is directly connected to what was just previously said. Well, what was just previously said, right? Well, we just talked about that. What did Jesus say? He said that the Son must be crucified for us to be reconciled to God. That's the point Jesus is making to Nicodemus. <coughs> and here in 16, he's answering the question then, why then? Why did the Son of God have to go to the cross? And what's that answer? Because of the love of God. Because God so loved the world. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. Because God so loved the world. So this is probably the, the most popular and, and likely one of the most quoted verses in all the Bible. This is also possibly the biggest hurdle for people who don't believe in the message of Jesus Christ. <coughs> there are likely people, maybe even here today, who are like Nicodemus, who are a little confused, a little disorientated by this entire conversation. See, belief for Nicodemus was rooted in his works and things that he could do and rules that he could follow. Maybe for others, it's putting your faith in something else, in another God, or someone else, or something else. But whoever you are, all of us, we believe in something, even if we don't believe in God. You see, 
we're never neutral when it comes to belief. Everyone here, hearing my voice, believes in and is following something. And what I don't want you to miss in this passage is the primary message that's being communicated in this verse is what separates the Christian faith from every other religion and every other belief in the world. Other beliefs like Islam, uh, Islam, for example, they believe that no part of creation resembles the likeness of God. That, that God cannot be seen and be in relationship with, but that He does still see all. They do believe that. But He's not personable. This God of Islam, you see, it requires absolute obedience to things like the five pillars, right? Memorizing the Quran, the Quran um, prayer multiple times a day, journeying to Mecca, fasting during Ramadan, being charitable, and then strict adherence to the rules in this life. But the Bible says we were created in the image of God and that we have value, that we have worth and dignity because we bear God's image. Our God, who exceeds all human understanding, has made himself known to us in the word that was written for us and by the word that was made into flesh. And this, this Christian God is, is perfect and holy and absolutely condemns sin and absolutely condemns disobedience. Yet this God in whom there is no sin took our sin upon himself that we might be saved, right? And then he empowers us to walk out the obedience that he commands. If you study Buddhism, Buddhists, for example, they believe that we don't ever actually die, but rather we enter this perpetual cycle of life and reincarnation until we've achieved nirvana, which is the perfect state of enlightenment. And every other life that we live along in the timeline of, of this perpetual cycle either moves us closer or further away from nirvana. But the Bible says, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in a, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's Romans 6.4. What separates Christianity from every other religion in the world is that our God not only has declared his love for us, but then he demonstrated his love for us. The Bible says that he loved the world. But how much did he love the world, right? How much did he actually love the world? To what extent, what, what extent did God love the world? He loved you and he loved me enough to send his one and only son to give us his one and only. Now you might be saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've heard that before, right? But I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm not ready to accept that. I'm not ready to believe that. that those thoughts just don't connect for me, right? <coughs> if that's the case, then what I want to do is draw your attention today to, to not to another religious system, but to a God who loves you. A God who, before the world was even created, knew you, loves you, and has brought that love to you in Jesus. Follow me here. Let me, let me propose something to you. Let, let me tell you a story, right? Imagine with me. Imagine that there is actually a God in heaven. And suppose that this God created the entire world. Imagine that in this process of creation, in creating everything in the world, the trees, the animals, etc., that, that he formed human beings. And as he formed the human beings, he, he gave those human beings the high, highest designation of all of creation because he fashioned them in his image to live in perfect relationship with him. Right? And imagine... He gave them only one command, and one command only. But then it took them like 15 minutes to rebel and do the very one thing He told them not to do. It's 
Suppose then God said, you deserve judgment for your revolt against me. But I'm going to provide a way for you to escape my judgment anyhow. And then as we follow, that's the story in creation, right? The Garden of Eden. And as we follow that story, he then calls Abraham out of paganism and brings Abraham to himself with the promise that he would make Abraham the father of a great nation and that he would bless the nations through his family, that he would indeed bless the entire world. And that because this nation, though, would repeatedly turn against God, imagine then God to reconcile them to himself. He says, well then, I will send you prophets to call you back to me. Because, well, you messed up before, Garden of Eden. Now you're going to mess up again, and you're going to need somebody to call you back. So I'm going to keep sending people to you. So he sends these prophets, right? So God sends the prophets to try to reconcile and bring them back to God. Well, what does this nation do then? Well, instead of heeding what the prophets say, these people would rise up and actually begin to kill those prophets. And imagine then God finally saying, you know what? I love you so much. And even though you don't deserve it, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to send you my son. My one and only eternal son. I'm going to send him to you. And again, what happened? What happened? The people rose up again and they killed him too, right? Listen to this. Imagine God loved these people so much that even while they were in the very act of killing his son, that he transferred the sins of those people who were killing him onto his son. And he said, if you will receive my love for you through the works of my son, through the death of my son, if you will receive my love through his works and through his death, if you will just turn your eyes to him and follow him, the death and the judgment that you deserve for rebelling against me, it will be gone. And instead... You will inherit eternal life with no pain, with no tears, with no evil, only joy that will increase continually for all of eternity. If God were to do all of that, would you believe that He loved you? If God did all of that for you, would you believe that He loved you? Because He did. And, and there's no other pleasure in this world. No other trinket, no other treasure, no other culture, no other religion that can accomplish for you what the God of heaven has done for you in Christ. C.S. Lewis, who's an incredibly wise man, he said this. He said that all of human history is a long and terrible story of man trying to find something other than God to make him happy. All we have to do today is place our trust in the finished work of Jesus. Jesus who did it on our behalf. Look to Jesus and to the fullness of life and into eternity that is waiting for you. The Bible says in Luke 11, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Why? Because God's love gives freely and fully to save and redeem. It's a love that gives, as I said. God's love gives. But it doesn't just stop there. In verse 17, this love is described in a different way, as I mentioned. And this is where I want to transition and speak to uh, people who would say, yes, I'm a Christian, right? Anybody in the room who is a follower of Christ, both from brand new believers to old sage, I've followed Jesus for all of my life, people. Verse 17 says, for, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Again here, we have that word for, right? For God so loved the world, for God did not send His Son. 
This verse is building on that last verse. That last, that last verse told us that God so loved the world that He gave us His Son. And because He did that, He was not sent, in, sent into the world to condemn the world. Why? Why wasn't Jesus sent to condemn the world? Does anybody know? Because we were already condemned, right? The world was already condemned. Since the garden, when Adam and Eve decided to rebel against God's gracious rule, rule, singular, they couldn't even follow one rule. Ever since then, mankind has been condemned to death. Romans 3.23 covers all of us. It says, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we needed something that, that no human could devise. We needed a solution to the problem of sin and death that we could not provide for ourselves. And John 3.17 is saying that, that God provided the solution. In sending His Son to take on flesh, to die on our behalf, to absorb the wrath of God for us, to grant us life through faith, God sent us the solution. The Son's mission as the sent one of God is not a coincidence, but it's a consequence of the love of God. The love that God has for us. And as followers of Christ, we are now grafted into the story of the Father, demonstrating and declaring His love through the mission that He has given to us through His Son. And being brought into the kingdom through faith in Jesus means we are now advancers of the kingdom with the message of Jesus. God sent the Son. And the Son is now sending us. Michael Goheen says it this way. The coming of the kingdom of God means a cosmic battle between God and Satan for the whole of creation and the whole of human life. God's power has been poured out to liberate the entire world from the power of sin, misery, death, idolatry, and Satan himself. An invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to take sides in this battle, to align oneself with him, and, and also to experience God's redemptive power. An overwhelming theme throughout all of the New Testament is that there are no neutral people in the kingdom of God. We have to pick a side. And we as Christ followers have been saved and we've been sent. Our allegiance is now to the kingdom of the beloved Son. And the orientation of our lives is now directed towards moving this gospel forward until we die or until Jesus returns. So that I'm clear, I want to say that again. There are no neutral people in the kingdom of God. We have been saved and we have been sent. Our allegiance is now to the kingdom of Jesus. And our lives need to be orientated to advancing the gospel until we die, until he comes again. Now listen to this starting in verse 18. Whoever believes in him, in Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. <coughs> the light has come into the world. Yet, what happened? People still loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things, they hate the light. And they do not come to the light lest their works be exposed. Jesus didn't come to the world to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. This passage is reminding us that there is a world out there, a world of people who do not believe in Jesus, who do not call on His name for salvation, who do not believe in the Son of God, and that without that, their, their, their path is directly towards hell. And this is why our understanding of what it means to be a sent people is such a big deal. Because the mission is not complete. That is what we have been sent out for. There is no room in the Bible for a follower of Christ to stand still. Every day, 
around you, around me, around all of us, I suspect, there are people who are far from God. There are, there are more than three billion people, in fact, on this planet who are living without Christ, for sure, and probably more. That's reality. Now, while you might not be able to, to reach somebody in India or New Zealand or Brazil or wherever, you can reach your neighbor next door. You can reach the kids down the street. You can reach the, the cashier at the gas station. A lot of your, your friends, a lot of your family, a lot of your neighbors, they don't know Jesus. And we are to be the sent people. Now, if all of this kind of freaks you out, right? You're going, this is hard. I, I don't feel equipped for this. I'm not brave enough to do this. It's, it's scary, pastor, to start a conversation with people who don't know God. You don't feel up to the task, right? Whatever that task is. Maybe you say, oh, I don't have the tools to do this. Or, ah, I don't know where to begin. Hear this from me. In the Bible, Christians are primarily armed with three things. God has given us the gospel of Jesus, the story of our salvation, and the Spirit of God. And that's everything that we need. That's really it. If you are a follower of Christ today, you have everything that you need to be a faithful and effective witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you don't have to worry about being perfect. That's not God's expectation. Be genuine. Be loving. Be persistent. The Holy Spirit is with you. If you are a follower of Christ in this room, please hear me. Do not settle for neutral Christianity. Don't be afraid. Don't just settle back into the comfort of the Christian bubble. Because when you do that, you miss out on the, the life and the power of God working through you. Yes, it is scary to step out of your comfort zone. But when you do it, God will honor it. We are called to be a Bible-believing, Spirit-filled, missional people, giving our lives away for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'll end with how I began our thoughts today. We can only, and all of our friends, and all of our family, and all of our neighbors, can only enter the kingdom of God through belief in the saving work of a son, his son, God's love has implications. God is a God who has given and He has sent us to continue to give fully and freely that people might be saved and they might be redeemed. Amen? We can change the world, folks, but it's on us. Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful that you have entrusted us with this idea that we might go forth and make disciples of all nations. And Lord, I know this message lands differently in different hearts. But God, I pray it is speaking to each and every one of us right now. I pray, Lord, that if anybody in this room is still far from you, hasn't made that decision, is, is uncertain about what they believe, or still struggling with doubts, that, God, you would make yourself known to them in abundant and apparent ways. And that through that, God, that they might believe in you. And, God, may they know that this is a safe place to come and ask questions. None of us are perfect. We've all failed. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We don't have it all figured out. In fact, a lot of us, were a mess. A mess just like them. But the good news is that in that mess, you reach down into our lives. You don't turn your back on us. You're not disgusted by our sin. You don't look at us and go, oh, I can't fix that. Oh, he messed up or she messed up too much. I can't, I can't redeem that. No. Instead, what you do, God, is you continue to chase after us, to seek us, to be in relationship with us. Because you love us. Not because we are worthy, 
but because you have chosen us. And God, I just pray that each and every one of us would accept that gift, that gift that you offer through your Son, Jesus, the gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, the chance to have eternal life with you if we would put our hope and trust in you and you alone. And God, I know there's a lot of people in this room who are trying to do their best, trying to live out faith, but they still feel like they're falling short in their struggle. They still know intimately that they missed the mark, that they haven't lived up to their own expectations of themselves, let alone your expectations of them. And God, in this moment, I pray that they would feel encouraged again, knowing intimately again your forgiveness. Lord, the church is not a place for perfect people, but it's a, a heart hospital for the broken. And I pray, God, that we would continue to keep that as our focus. God, make yourself known to all of us this week. And God, as we go forth, may we go forth into the world as ambassadors of your light and your love. May we go forth as ones who are forgiven. And may we offer that grace and mercy to all that we might encounter. God, you are so good and we are thankful. Lord Jesus, continue to be with us, strengthening us, leading us, guiding us in all things. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen. Again, we, we're so glad that you are here today at Glory Baptist Church. God is good. Jesus loves you. If you haven't heard that, hear it now. Jesus loves you. If you need some prayer today, there will be a prayer team here at the front. They would love to pray with you. Come on down and they'll pray with you before you get out of here. Otherwise, go forth into the world. Do amazing things. We have the power through the Holy Spirit to change the world. So get to it. Go and serve your King. Amen.